Michael for inviting me again. Um, and I typically seem to be the shit disturber at the end of the day or near the end of the day that kind of tries to challenge this group with some of our thinking and stuff. So um, what I'd really like to do before I get into my presentation is just I'd love to hear from three people in the audience about what we think we've learned over the past year as a group, as crowdsourcing specialists, experts, leaders, practitioners. What do we think we've learned in the last year? Michael, you got to be the first one. I'm not too positive about it. Uh, I'm a realist. So I think okay. we learned that it's harder to really reach the goals we think we already reached and try to convince the, it's not old school, but it's the old thinking and to really move them to change. And change is always losing control and being transparent. And we are not even there yet by half. So we're still in the future and everyone is kind of catching up. Our time hasn't come yet. Yeah, we're like in a spaceship here, right? And we, we try to work together in kind of sort of way to understand where the other chances and problems are and then develop it for the next year. Okay, cool. Anybody else? Come on, I'm trying to get some energy in here. Uh, antidotally, I don't think we've broken down any barriers to investment. We're just talking to basically accredited investors and selling them a brand new scheme. Yeah. Okay, cool. Over there. Seen an, um, sorry, in the last 12 months, I've seen an unusual thing happening at a lot of the open innovation and crowdsourcing conferences is the sense that people have started to move crowdsourcing and crowdfunding into one business model. And I suppose the, after many years of them being, oh, no, 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 they're completely different things. In the last 12 months for me, there's a big push from initiatives to move the two into one model, uh, which is what they used to do in Finland a thousand years ago. So it's nice to see that they're, they're finally going back to the way that crowdsourcing originally was hundreds of years ago, they've to actually merged value. the two models to yeah. create value. Exactly. So that's a positive development just to stop yeah. the other negatives there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's, a, that's cool. Um, that's kind of a cool segue into what we do at Better because we do exactly that. So we do that whole idea of what's the business model of crowdsourcing. Um, and then what we've done is we've just called it participation instead of crowdsourcing so that we didn't have to deal with that legacy language and stuff. So, um, so I guess today I didn't really want to talk about what we know, but maybe talk a little bit about what we think is part of our landscape and how it might ultimately have some kind of impact on us and our thinking about where we're going and what we're doing. So... Um, I threw this quote in here. I don't know if you guys know John Patel, but he used to do the Web 2.0 summits in the Valley. Um, and uh, he was with Wired way back. Um, and I thought this was a great quote. It's kind of like we're on the brink of something new. Um, and if we actually do these things, shared principles of integrity, transparency, and sustainability, we will create a better place. Um, and that definitely inspires us at, at better. So five provocations, um, and then maybe a call to action. So trust and transparency. Um, I think, you know, since last year, we've seen a lot of things happen um, in, this, um, in this topic. Um, we're seeing that, you know, this line between what's private and public is going away. Um, and I think that there's been some really good examples of that. Um, Volkswagen, even in your own backyard here in Europe, um, we had a large organization, you know, being deceitful in the market. Um, and now it is actually having an impact on what consumers think of that brand. And I think it was just recently, you know, that sales figures in the U.S. are, are way down. Panama Papers, another great example. Um, so um, 
you know, different individuals have been exposed through the Panama Paper um, unraveling. Um, in fact, we saw just yesterday that the Danish government um, actually bought some of the Panama Papers so that they can investigate 600 of their citizens for um, evasion of taxes. Um, so, you know, again, this whole idea of, you know, trust and transparency, what's, what's really going on? People are starting to call it out. Um, who made my clothes? I don't know if you've seen this, but there's many different movements now where you actually have to disclose where your clothes came from. Um, and that's becoming a differentiator as a buyer. Where did this come from? Who was involved in making this product? And there's even startups. Um, that are embedding themselves inside of the supply chain so that you can see if you're using any human slavery or any human um, or any labor that's just not appropriate inside of your supply chain. So this whole idea, you know, that anyone can be a whistleblower, that's really the time that we're, that we're at right now. And I think crowd has played a big role in that in democratizing these traditional processes. We call stuff out. The, the crowd is, you know, kind of in charge. Um, and so what's happening is there's a revolution in everything, in business, um, in government, in your local communities, um, trust and transparency is, is becoming um, paramount. Um, and so we often talk about, well, what is the API of we, right? So what is the power of all of us plugging into our community or plugging into a brand or plugging into a government? Um, and so we really have the power to make this change, and that's what... You know, that was the antithesis of crowdsourcing when it started. Um, another great quote, um, and it's really about, you know, um, the Lego CEO talks about um, the customers being an avenue of truth. And Lego has done a tremendous job of becoming a participative organization and getting their market, um, their employees, and their advocates really involved in their business. Unlearning. And why is this the new competitive advantage? Um, who do your customers really want you to become? So it's that whole idea of, you know, there's these new business models. Um, Airbnb went and talked with Hyatt at the very beginning and said, hey, we've got this idea. Hyatt said, not interested. Um, look at Airbnb's progress over Hyatt over the years. Uber, again, there's all of these business models um, that have started, and they don't own anything. Airbnb doesn't own anything. Uber doesn't own anything. It's labor. It's, it's um, crowds creating these business models. Um, and also to Facebook. Um, I think that's another good example. Facebook was built on the backs of you and I, creating content, making connections, making friends, having private messages, um, and you know, providing a platform that could be monetized. Um, so what we often say um, to our customers and our partners is, um, you will be disrupted. Um, and the crowd is a mechanism to that disruption. And all of the examples um, that I just kind of flipped through are examples of kind of a crowd-powered business. Um, and so we often go, you know, if you were to disrupt your business, if you were physically going to leave your building, walk across the street and set up a new business and call it 2.0 of your business, who would you take with you and what would that business be? Because somebody is already doing that today. Um, and crowd or participation is most likely at the heart of that. Um, product roadmap. Um, and this one is kind of near and dear to me around the whole concept of um, being married to a product. Um, and I come from a product background. I have built products. I have commercialized products. Um, but I always found that the customer wasn't really at the heart of that. We would always kind of retrofit that product into the customer environment and hope that they would drive some value. And we believe that that's kind of getting flipped over on its head, and it's really about participation roadmap. So what do your stakeholders want from your business and how can you provide an enabling infrastructure or technology to make that happen? So we say don't get married to a product because it's actually going to limit your thinking and your capability as an organization. You'll go, that platform or that product only does this, so that's all that we can do. And we say get married to your stakeholders and drive participation with those stakeholders. 
And this is just an example, right? So how might you build a participation roadmap? And this is a, a visual that we use sometimes where we say, OK, so you've got your stakeholders. What could they provide to you? They could be employees. They could be customers. They could be fans. What could they contribute to you? And then what does the organization do with that? And there's different things that can come to play here. There's obviously, you know, what can we see with the human eye? So your stakeholder goes, I think we should go in this direction. Then there's that human competition. Should we do that? Should we pursue that? What are the risks and opportunities of doing that? And then you look at, you know, the machine or AI. So if you apply um, these new forms of technology to what your stakeholders are saying you need to do, well, what new learnings are coming out of that? And then ultimately, the business has an opportunity um, to do something with this and to create some value. But again, what we're proponents of, and we believe that this is a future, and we call it participation and not crowdsourcing, is that the value also has to flow back to the stakeholders. So if your employees are reinventing your business from the inside out, how are they sharing in that value that's being created? It's no longer a job and a gift card for the weekend to go out for dinner. That's nice, but everyone is actually invested in the solution. And so they need to be part of the value that's being created. So we talk about capturing that value, creating that value, and commercializing that value. So how do you harness the power of your crowd through participation to do that? Um, I think this is another disruptive um, thing that's going on too. Um, I don't know who in here has, you know, kind of experience with software as a service. Um, and, you know, our experience is starting to lend itself to say it's, it's not really, number one, it's not really needed and nor does it kind of fit everything. Um, and we want organizations to think of themselves as a platform. So how do they become an enabler? And it's not by buying a piece of software. It's by a cultural shift. It's a cultural shift that says we are going to enable our key stakeholders to contribute to our business, whether they're internal or external. We're going to create a porous organization, and we're going to put that technology in place in order to make that happen. That technology doesn't mean a crowdsourcing platform. That's an infrastructure that's pervasive across the, across the enterprise. And so today, organizations, you know, the organizations that we work with, um, and there might be some of those organizations in the room, they have so many tools at their disposal. Technology is becoming a commodity. Many problems or many challenges have been solved. It's what you do on top of the software and the value that you create so that your organization becomes a platform. So I'm kind of just clicking through here. And now, we're going to kind of just stay in this theme and just go, OK, what are some examples of participation? And I don't know if the formatting is off here for you guys, too, but it is down here. Um, so walk through five examples of participation um, that you wouldn't necessarily call them crowdsourcing. Um, but again, it's organizations using the power of the crowd or using the power of participation to do something different. And this is a really cool example. And we've got a test load in the parking lot. So cool, I didn't know that. Um, but this one, um, you know, I kind of call it uh, participation go to market. So it's this whole idea of how do you use your customers to help you go to market. Um, and so Tesla doesn't have a CMO. At least that's the rumor. They don't have a CMO. So instead, what they did was they put in a program called Refer a Friend. And so if you bought a Tesla, um, you could refer a friend to buy a Tesla, and you would get an incentive for referring your friend to buy a Tesla. There, have, there are some people, and I know Steve, my colleague here, my partner in crime, he knows all the stats. But there's someone in Canada who I think is number two on the leaderboard. I think he's earned $75,000 just by referring friends to buy a Tesla. So Tesla has been able to use its own customers to help to take these cars to market, right? That's not really that complicated. Um, but that's a new business model. Um, I think lots of people know this story. It's one of my favorite stories. Um, it's this idea of, oh, now I'm really I'm out of time. Um, so Lego uses the power of the fans to bring products to market. 
Um, and those products are best performing in the portfolio by a margin perspective. Unilever, um, they've supported 95 startups to help them advance their sustainability agenda. Those startups, again, are part of their organization, but they're harnessing the power of those startups for their, their objectives. Patagonia, another, um, another great example where they tell their customers not to buy more, not to buy more, and to reuse it, to recycle it. And they've got programs, and in fact, they've got trucks driving across the US that you can go to and you can say, fix my Patagonia jacket, right? So it's using the power of the consumer to help them build a new business model, which is recycling, reusing. And Steve knows a little bit about this one too. So this whole idea of being a participation enabler and not a software provider. So I know some of us in this room are selling software and I'm saying become an enabler for what the customer wants to do. And then I would say on the flip side, if you are a client or a corporation inside of this room, think twice before buying that software. Because do you actually have a strategy to build value on top of that software? I'll flip through this really quick. Gig economy, we know all this stuff. Robots are taking over. Five million jobs that will be replaced by robots. All of these stats. I've got three recommendations. So we're all part of this movement, crowdsourcing, participation, whatever we call it. Um, I love collaborating with Michael on the future of this event and, and where, you know, where it's come from, where it's going. It's awesome. But we are a tribe. We believe in something. Um, and I would encourage us to leverage from each other and build this tribe and build our own tribe back at our organizations and find those people who believe in what you're doing. Infect your organization and the possibilities of crowdsourcing and participation. Number two, go on a mission. So state something ambitious. You want to disrupt your own company. How are you going to do that? How are you going to use people that are not employed by your organization to make that happen? And then I would say be relentless. Embrace the economics and the humanity of whatever you're going to do. So we're all still humans. We're going to lead through human. We're going to be enabled by all of this new technology that's coming at us. But let's really bring that human and that economic um, component together. And I always say, imagine what the next Facebook, Google, Uber would look like if whoever, you know, if everyone who is sharing and building that product actually shared in the value. And now there's even rumors that the next Facebook's going to come out of Europe. So the challenge would be out to this group. Let's look at a different business model. Let's not look at a Facebook model that's advertising on top of you. So what are these new business models that we can explore? either in our corporation or either ourselves as, as providers or provisioners of, of these inspiring thoughts and ideas and implementation. That's it. <laughs>